again, I apologize for making you wait. Uh, today we're going. Today we're going to talk about action potentials. On Monday, we talked about the microscopic, individual, single-channel basis of action potentials and of electrical signaling in the nervous system. Today, we're going to talk about macroscopic events. And if the gods are with us, I will show you some simulations. And the first point to make is that electricity is a language of the brain. And so we understand, we need to understand electricity. And uh, I'm going to show you a movie. Uh, okay. This movie uh, is taken from the brain of a rat. There is a sharp electrode inside the cell uh, inside that cell, recording voltage, and some, uh, and uh, you may remember that most often these days in isolated preparations, we don't use sharp electrodes, but we use patch electrodes. Uh, but in this case, uh, there are definite advantages to using sharp electrodes, and uh, in all cases, of course, when one measures a voltage and electrical potential. One measures it between two points. So we are looking at the difference between the voltage inside a neuron and the voltage outside the neuron. Are going to remove the speaker and let's see if we can turn on the volume in the room. And we go back. Let's see if we can try that now. Raise your hand if you did not hear that. Is it coming to speakers too? Okay, so uh, what we see here, again, with my apologies, is the time course that you might see on an old fashioned oscilloscope, oscilloscope, or on modern computer screens of a cell. In this particular case, are actually artificially inducing the cell to fire spikes because we are putting current through the electrode. We are putting current through the electrode as well, and so decreasing its membrane potential from roughly uh, uh, minus. depolarized value, that is to a less negative value, that is to a more positive value, all of those words mean the same, and we are bringing the cell to a position where it fires action potentials more rapidly, and we turn off the um, applied current slowly, the experimenter has a little dial that is dialing, and he turns it back, and the cell uh, goes back to firing on its own, but at a much lower frequency. And so many cells have what's called pacemaker activity. They fire on their own. This one does as well. Uh, but in addition, um, it can be induced to fire more frequently uh, with uh, a, uh, an extra stimulus. Now, uh, the experimenter has also taken the signal from the cell and connected it up to an audio channel, to a speaker. And that's what we are hearing. Here we go. Uh, 
So there are a few interesting aspects of this recording. We'll play it again. Uh, the spikes in this recording, the action potentials. are between 50 and 100 millivolts in amplitude. In amplitude. Uh, typically, in this particular case, they were going all the way to zero. But in fact, in most cases, they would overshoot zero to plus 50 millivolts or so, which is the Nernst potential for sodium. The key, though, is that the cell is encoding messages and sending it to other cells via synapses. Uh, and is releasing transmitter. Uh, now, um, there are some very interesting aspects to these traces. For instance, there appears to be lots of deep structure where a cell actually becomes hyperpolarized for a while and then depolarized as it is pacemaking. And there are some ion channels that are responsible for that. And also, when the experimenter begins to add current, the uh, the cell does not immediately respond with a graded higher frequency. Most do, but this one does not, and that's because of some other electrical characteristics of a, of a channel that essentially put it into a no man's land between two extremes of membrane potential. And it would take deep simulations of the various channels and their state <coughs> to understand this, but it has been done, and uh, that is what happens. So this is an example of electrical signaling in a cell. And the audio that you heard is a very common occurrence in a neuroscience lab. People are always listening to the audio from an electrode, always nodding when a cell responds more quickly or less quickly, except that these days it's possible to have multi-electrode arrays so you can hear Res uh, signals from many cells at once. You have to be careful that the audio signal does not itself uh, distort the experiment, but once that's done, it's fairly nice. Let's go to another example now in which a cell also from the thalamus uh, is being uh, exposed not simply Well, never show off your kids, your dog, or your software. Uh, this played just well. Let's look at uh, this recording. Here we are. So now we have a, I'll, sh I'll go back to that. It wasn't doing very well. Uh, again, we have the sharp electrode inside the cell. We have, we're recording the difference between the inside and the outside of the cell. But here, instead of applying current, we are applying a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, that's ACH. And uh, the cell um, seems to be responding to acetylcholine. Oh, I, but again, not in a simple fashion. Let's see if that happens again. Now, I'm so sorry. It was working fine. Now the experimenter adds the acetylcholine. You can hear the spikes. And then it stops. Now, if you look carefully, before the acetylcholine was added, the action potentials, which were being filmed from an old-fashioned oscilloscope whose screen glowed, seemed to have a triangular base. But during acetylcholine, they were much sharper. And this is part of the encoding properties of any neuron, that spikes can indeed accompanied by sub-threshold, 
oscillations. Now, what you don't see in these beginning spikes is that they're actually quite large. The triangle part that you see is actually the, just the base. So let's try that once more. You can just barely see the entire spike there on the screen. So, again, cells respond chemically. They respond, uh, first of all, electrically. They also respond chemically because chemistry is also a lang language of the brain. We'll learn in detail that the artificially applied acetylcholine is acting on muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, again, changing the membrane potential and increasing the action potential frequency. Any questions about what we just saw and its importance in neuroscience? Yes. Uh, so the, uh, the first initial spikes, were those induced? Uh, so the question is whether the first initial spikes were induced. The answer is no. This was the cell pacemaking on its own. Why did it go flat when they put it in acetylcholine at the beginning? This cell, like the previous cell, has a no man's land of membrane potential uh, where it does not like to fire spikes. It actually has two states, and this has to do with its complement of ion channels. Uh, in detail, it's called a T-type calcium channel, but the encoding properties of this neuron are fairly complex. Any other questions? Okay, so today's lecture does involve electrical circuits, and so you should remove, renew your material from Phys 1B. And you can also look in Candel, the textbook, at appendix, appendix A. I'm going to plug the <coughs> microphone back in. Because I think you get better, um, you get a better recording on the video. At least I hope so. Okay, you can still hear me fine, can you? Good. So, uh, the hero of the story today is very much the electrically excitable sodium channel. And it's been only a couple of years now that we've actually had atomic scale structures of electrically excitable sodium channels, although potassium channels have been known for now as crystal structures for about 20 years. Uh, you'll remember that the electrically excitable sodium channel has four domains, homology domains, only one subunit, but potassium channels have four distinct subunits that come together and look a whole lot like this. Uh, and the key point for today, absolutely, is that an open channel looks, acts electrically like a conductor. Now, this is not perfect because the concentration of ions on the inside and the outside of the cell, sodium ions, differs. There's more on the outside, less on the inside. So it's not a perfectly linear resistor. You could say that it acts a bit like a diode and rectifies a little bit. But on the whole, we find it very convenient. Instead of talking about the physical chemistry of ions entering the pathway or going out, to talk about the open channel as a conductor. Now, this, and so each open channel uh, then is a conductor. And furthermore, because it's gated and can be either open or closed, but not intermediate, each of these little open channels has a switch associated with it. When the switch is straight up, then the channel is open. When the switch is slanted, then the channel is closed. Um, and the, the reason that we use conductors rather than resistors is that, as you learned in Phys 1, uh, conductors add in parallel. Resistors don't. There's this complex form. Resistors do add in series, but we won't mention that again. Conductors add in parallel. So each channel has associated with it its conductance, 
it's switch and it's got a little battery associated with it. And that battery is the Nernst potential for the ion that's permeant through that channel. So if all, and so there is a macroscopic conductance, which is simply the sum of all of the little single channel conductances. And now we make the macroscopic conductance look like a rheostat or potentiometer, but we understand that it's actually just how many of these little switches are up or to the side at any point. Uh, and then the battery associated with that macroscopic conductance is the battery for all of these little channels. The sodium, we're, we usually use sodium in red. And so the Nernst potential for sodium is plus 60 millivolts. There are more sodium ions on the outside than on the inside. And we derived that from first principles at the beginning of last week. Uh, and there are mostly potassium ions on the inside. So electrically, it's very convenient to talk about this combination of phenomena. Physical chemistry down here, ions going through electricity up here with an equivalent circuit. Would anyone like me to use more words or different words to describe this? Okay. Ah, but there's complications. Okay. The complications are that there are several types of channels in the membrane. In particular, not only are there sodium channels, but there are also potassium channels. And each potassium channel has its own conductance, which may differ from the conductance from, for the sodium channel, has its own switch, whether that potassium channel is open or closed, and has its own battery, which is the Nernst potential for the potassium channel. And so we sum all of the potassium channels as well in a macroscopic symbol like a potentiometer, like a variable conductance. When we call that conductance uh, G, the, we typically use for the microscopic conductances a little gamma, and for the macroscopic conductances a large G. Well, we had to call them something. So, as you know, conductances are usually called Gs. G equals 1 over R. And so we have a G sodium, which consists of a sum of all of the little gamma sodiums that are open at the time, and a G potassium, which equals the sum of all the potassium conductances that are open at any time. So in the membrane, we have this green potassium conductance and this red sodium channel. And most of the time, here is a key, all of the time, since time immemorial, immemorial, these circuits obey Kirchhoff's law. That is, charge is neither created nor destroyed. That means that a current that flows inward through a sodium channel <clears throat> has to flow outward some other way. And typically, since there are potassium channels inside the cell, in sodium channels outside the cell, the simple, the most likely event is that charge gets conserved by sodium ions flowing into the cell and potassium ions flowing out of the cell. Now, the charge carriers change their identity, sodium flowing in, potassium flowing out. The brain, the cell, needs to pump those back up again using transporters and splitting ATP in between action potentials. But take my word for it, we conserve charge. Any complications or questions? OK, so these principles, variable resistors, voltages, Kirchhoff's law, allow one to make an equivalent circuit. Now we take the entire cell. And I think I probably will not talk about little gammas anymore. We're only going to talk about large macroscopic Gs. Is that okay? All right. So we take now from Kirchhoff's law, it is possible 
on the back of an envelope or on a sketch pad or, how, or however to deduce that the membrane potential will be dominated by the conductance which is largest at any time. And all this has to do with Kirchhoff's law and being sure that what flows into any of these junctions also flows out, conservation of charge. So, uh, what works out is that the membrane potential at any time is a weighted sum of each of the con of each of the Nernst potentials, EK or ENA or chloride. We haven't we haven't talked about chloride much. Well, we did when we talked about the ivermectin channel on Monday after the Nobel Prize. That's a chloride channel. Um, so, if GK is largest, then this first term and the bottom term dom term dominate. If GNA is largest, then this term dominates, etc. All right, now that you see this little C here, you remember we talked about the fact that the membrane has a very high electric field in its dielectric and is very, uh, which is very small. That means that the membrane has a large capacitance. And so, as you know, current through a capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the first derivative of the voltage. So here, for the moment, we are talking about only steady state, where dV by dt equals zero. And so the current through the capacitor, which is in parallel with the resistors, is zero. And that's one of the great things about the voltage clamp. The voltage is clamped, dV by dt equals zero. And then as instantaneously as the electronics will allow, the voltage is stepped to another area, to another place. dV by dt becomes very large and the capacitive current becomes very large, but so fast that it doesn't bother the experiment. And then the voltage remains clamped at another membrane potential. So that's why the voltage clamp is so useful. Now, technically, it's steady state, not equilibrium. Because, as we mentioned, those ions are replacing each other in the extracellular solution, need to be pumped back in again, and the sodium potassium ATPase is working. So, if only one set of channels were open, say the, sodium, the potassium channel, we would have equilibrium. But with two of them fighting against each other, everything begins to run down. We need to eat, and two thirds of the ATP consumed in the brain is consumed by the sodium potassium ATPase, which pumps us back up again. And my friend Chris Miller is fond of saying that potassium channels are highly selective for potassium, about a factor of a thousand to one. And if they were not so highly selective for potassium, if a little sodium leaked through them, your brain would have to work much harder than it does, and it would be much hotter than it is. So, thank goodness that those potassium channels are completely selective to potassium. Everybody with us so far? Any questions? Okay. So, at the resting potential, only potassium channels are open. EK dominates. At the peak of the action potential, as we'll see, the GK doesn't don't close, but there are many more sodium channels open a larger sodium conductance, and it open, they open too, and they dominate. And so during that peak of the action potential, the flow, currents are flowing into the sodium channels, out of the potassium channels, and there's lots and lots of ions going back and forth. Kirchhoff's law gets obeyed, but those ions are fluxing in and fluxing out, and so we're running down the potential, the ion gradients, and in between action potentials, the sodium potassium pump needs to clean things up. Now, this is a lot easier for a squid axon to do, and we're going to be talking about the squid axon, than it is for a little, um, a small diameter um, cell in the brain. We'll talk about that. And then, as we're going to see after the action potential, more potassium channels open, we get a little bit of a hyperpolarization, and we go even further toward the potassium equilibrium 
the potassium nerve potential. Alrighty, now we are going to simulate the nerve impulse. And we're going to simulate the nerve impulse as though we were doing a macroscopic version of the microscopic simulations that I showed you uh, on Monday. Same types of Markov probabilities now transformed in the macroscopic case into differential equations that change the G's, the macroscopic G's. Um, and we're going to go to the same website, which is Pancho Betsinia's website at the University of Chicago. All right, so we turn off David McCormick's website and we go to Panchinio, Pancho Betsinia's website. Now, um, he just redid his website to avoid using Java. It doesn't work very well. So we're going to go back to the Java, Java version. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is that we are going to use a squid axon. A squid axon is enormous. It is, I think I showed you very briefly what a squid axon looks like. Here it is. Here's the squid. Its axon runs from the brain to the end of the mantle. It gives the squid, and because it's so large, it conducts very rapidly. Invertebrates have not yet invented myelin, so they have to use large axons to conduct rapidly. And in one of your uh, problem sets, you're actually going to experimentally verify using simulations the dependence of conduction velocity on the diameter of the axon. So the escape response of the squid is that the mantle contracts simultaneously squirts water out of the siphon, squid escapes, sometimes a little ink too to confuse the predator. And this happens rapidly enough so that the squid survives to do it again the next time. In order to uh, contract simultaneously, all of the muscles in the mantle need to get stimulated at the same time. And so the action potential needs to get to the end of the mantle as as quickly as it gets to the beginning of the mantle so that longest fibers need to conduct more rapidly and they have a larger diameter and they are the ones that neurophysiologists used in the 30s and 40s and 50s to get a good idea about the permeability of the membrane. They are so large half a millimeter in diameter that you could actually stick a wire down the middle. Sticking a wire down the middle for passing current had the great advantage of being easy and macroscopic and you could get large currents. But also when you stick a wire down the middle, then because the wire is a conductor, the membrane potential be doesn't vary, doesn't propagate. And so that's called the space clamped version. And so, we are going to look at, uh, I'm going to reset the parameters. Nerve. Let's go back to okay, nerve impulse. Turn this guy off just to make sure we are in the right place. And unfortunately, we are not going to use the new version that runs without Java. Can everybody see? Instead, we are going to use the older version, which runs on my computer. All right. So we are going to do a... Uh, When did this get grayed out? You know, the number of times that you rehearse this and it still doesn't work. Just let's go back to uh, reset the parameters. Uh, 
nothing is working today. All right, stay calm. Okay, nerve impulse. Nerve. And why is it grayed out? All right, so. I spent three hours rehearsing this. Yeah, good idea. Thanks. Uh, the non-Java work version worked very poorly for me. Okay. Okay, Java is reopening, which is a good sign. Ah. How many devices were in Java? Billions? Except for, whoops, vanished. Oh, this is weird. All right. So, membrane action potential. Okay. So we have our wire inside a squid axon. We have, we're measuring the voltage between the outside and the inside. This particular case is when we give a little pulse of current and we get an action potential. We're going to build up to that. What we're going to do now is simply to do, uh -huh, something a lot simpler which is that we are going to show the passive properties of the membrane as there were as though there were no voltage gated channels and to do that we go to our control panel for the axon and we you would do this pharmacologically with a blocker of sodium channels or you would do it genetically with a knockout for the sodium channels. I'm going to do it digitally. There we are. Uh, and uh, do the same thing to the potassium channels. Okay. Now we no longer have the action potential. We have something that looks a lot simpler. And uh, we are going to go to the pulses. And we are going to make the pulses... First of all, a bit delayed. And we're going to get, make them smaller and longer. And we will make the whole plot longer. All right, so we have this very simple boring waveform. Here is the current. It's just a little pulse of current that we are telling the axon to put in. Jonathan, thanks for the hit. The hint. That was good. And um, we are um, seeing this RC, resistance capacitance depolarization. The change in voltage doesn't occur instantaneously because the 
membrane has a capacitance which needs to be charged up but everything is linear and you can see that it's linear the easiest way to see that it's linear is to make this guy negative and uh, it goes the other way but is as large for a negative pulse as for a positive pulse so this is really boring the next thing we're going to do is to make things more lively by resetting the parameters okay and uh, now what we're going to do is to cut that We once again have a axon that fires an action potential, just one. And we note that here is the resting potential before we have put the current in. Here's a little blip of current that we are putting through the wire. It takes a little while, but the axon finally does get to threshold and fires the spike, which overshoots from zero. And then after the spike, it actually goes below its normal resting potential. That is the after hyperpolarization or the overshoot or other terms. And you'll remember that at this point, only potassium channels are open. At this point, sodium channels are open in addition to the potassium channels, and that makes the membrane potential go to ENA. And at this point, the sodium channels have again closed mostly through inactivation, but also because they are voltage dependent and the membrane has gone back to zero. And as an extra kick, more potassium channels have opened and this has the selective advantage of rapidly terminating the action potential so that it's clean and fast. So now we are going to do uh, an experiment that fascinated physiologists for roughly the first year, 50 years or so. Of uh, neurophysiology, and that was to define threshold. And so here we have a current pulse that is about 10 milliseconds long and uh, Let's see what happens when we make it only one millisecond long. We don't get an action potential. Let's go to four milliseconds long. We do get an action potential. Oh, sorry, that's 41. I didn't, yeah, okay. We don't get an action potential. Well, let's go try five. We wait a while, but we finally get an action potential. Let's go to 4.9. No, 4.99, we'll try that, etc. So there is a well-defined, well, there is a reasonably well-defined threshold. It depends on the amount of current we put through, depends on lots of parameters of the axon. But when we get a spike, it's always the same size no matter how long we had to wait. And that is because of the regenerative nature of the action potential. So now, how could a Markov process, which depends only on the history of things, turn into a regenerative event, which is a sodium channel, a sodium spike that turns on and then off? Well, you need to get deeply into the models for the sodium channel and its inactivation and the models for the potassium channel and its activation to understand it. Um, now, one thing that we can do is that we can look at the refractory period. And the way we look at the refractory period, um, oh, you know what, we can plot, we can plot um, GNA and GK all right, so now what we're going to do is actually to plot the, sodium, the number of sodium and potassium channels open 
at any given time. That's not really good. That really doesn't show very well. So let's try plotting the currents instead. No, that doesn't show either. Well, we could actually see the conductance for GK and GNA. And remember, that's the total number of channels open at any one point. If we could expand things, and I'm not sure how to do that. Um, let's turn off. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. Uh, we would actually see the spatial evolution of the sodium channels opening and then closing and of the potassium channels opening and closing. Uh, let's look at another interesting point, which is the refractory period. Okay, so the refractory period, uh, to do that, we uh, give it a total time of 30 milliseconds. And uh, we get two pulses. And the third pulse is going to be rather strong. It's going to be 30 microamps. Okay, and the first one is going to be back to 10. And we are actually going to wait for, let's say, 12 milliseconds here. There's a bunch of things that we're plotting that we don't want to variables to plot. Yeah, now we are actually seeing GNA and INA, but I'm going to turn those off. Okay, so now we've given two stimuli and we have two action potentials. But because of this hyperpolarization that takes a while and because sodium channels get inactivated, uh, another action potential cannot follow instantaneously after the first. So let's go to five milliseconds. We don't see another action potential. Let's go to seven milliseconds. Now this is a violation of what I told you. What I told you is that action potentials always have the same amplitude. Well, obviously that's not always the case, but it's pretty robust. And uh, let's go to 20. and uh, things are fine. And so there's this period of time after which an accident, an axon can fire an action potential, can't fire another one. Well, if it could, uh, it would just go into spasms. We call that the refractory period. Uh, and so, where is my screen? There it is. So we have been to uh, the spatially homogeneous membrane, the membrane action potential, which can be simulated here by our wire and an axon, but it's also pretty well approached by having a spherical cell with an electrode in the middle. Or it can also be approached by having a very small region of the membrane. That would be a patch in a patch clamp. And I showed you the passive properties of the membrane. I turned off all the conductance. And then I showed you threshold. And we talked about the hyperpolarization caused by the potassium conductance and the refractory period. Uh, now we are going to look at the frequency code. So in order to do that, we're going to go and we won't be able to get through everything today. We'll go back, reset all the parameters, and we will do the frequency code. And, and what we're going to discover is that this is an imperfect frequency encoder, which is pretty interesting. I'll turn that off. Okay. And we'll put the spike back on. Okay. And we are going to make the uh, 
total time 40 milliseconds, which it is now, and we are going to lengthen the pulse from 1 to 30 milliseconds. So we're going to go to 30 milliseconds. Why is the total time not 40 milliseconds? There we are. Now, what you can see here is again a, if we keep the pulse on all the time, we do see a train of action potentials. And in fact, if we did this in a real cell, the subsequent action potentials might be slightly smaller than the first, but not so much smaller as simulated here. And that's because the real cell has not just one type of sodium channel or one type of potassium channel, but several types of potassium channels which really tailor the repetitive firing frequencies of those cells which need to fire. Now, a squid axon does not need to fire repetitively or pacemaker on its own. It does so by having synapses excite it, and each time there's a presynaptic potential, uh, each time there's a synapse firing it, the action potential gets propagated and the mantle conducts, and the mantle contracts. But you remember the cells that I showed you at the beginning of the talk in David McCormick's lab at Yale were pacemaking on their own and had variable frequencies depending on what kind of input they were getting. And so those cells have an additional complement of channels not simulated here that enable them to fire repetitively as a function of how much current they're getting. Let's turn this down to five microamps. And uh, we don't see repetitive, that's 50. We see repetitive firing, but at a lower frequency. And if we go down to four, we don't ever get to threshold. Yeah, we did. We, we, again, we get a lower frequency. Now, this is a poor approximation of the encoding properties of a real axon, uh, of a real cell body, not an axon, but a cell body, which is much more complex. Now, there's one other point that I want to make, and this is that I've told you about unpropagated action potentials. Um, and now we are going to look at the propagated action potential. And we're do, let's do it x versus y. Let's try it. X, there it is. OK, so here. We are looking at the voltage, stop, we're putting a little current through this. Now we, we no longer have a clamped axon, we no longer have a wire down it, but we're looking at regions of the axon that have sodium channels open. Those sodium channels then shock the next region of the axon, producing a threshold there shock a neighboring region, producing threshold there, et cetera. And so if we start this out, we put some current through, we get a spike, and it propagates with distance along the axon. In, instead of plotting x versus t, we can plot, sorry, x, uh, uh, voltage versus distance, we can plot voltage versus time, which is in some ways much more interesting. So what we have here is a stimulating electrode, a recording electrode right next to it, one two and a half centimeters away and one five centimeters away from it. And so what happens then is that, uh, why are we, oh right, why are we doing that? Just reset the parameters again. We'll try it again using Jonathan Liu's law. Uh, we'll try. Uh, 
versus V versus T. All right, closing the browser. Sir. Yeah. And looked at. So, so the question was, it seemed to be a propagating backwards. Uh, you know, that's a great question, but it is an illusion of the fact that you are looking at it with time. And so, if you think about it, yes, the beginning of the action potential is sharp at any one point, but if you go back toward the beginning, it looks like the end of the action potential. And so that is a an impression that you get from doing it versus X. It's much easier to do it versus T when you don't get that impression. So here now, we are stimulating that point at the point on the left, and we are recording from three different positions. We get this nice stimulating pulse, and we get the action potential propagating two and a half centimeters and five centimeters. Let's start it again. So in one of your problem sets, you are actually going to run this simulation and you are going to vary the parameters of the axon and ask how the conduction velocity varies with those parameters. Uh, to give you a very simple example, um, we can then I'll let you go. Uh, let's change the temperature. This squid axon f was measured at 6.3 degrees centigrade. At the end of the 40s, people had these vacuum tube electronics. Their electronics was working really hard. These um, processes were pretty fast, and in order to make them measurable, they cooled down the animal, cooled down the axon, and measured it as, as cool as possible. But we live at 37 degrees centigrade, so let's compute this at 37 degrees centigrade. Uh, right. All right. Didn't work. Let Let's pretend we're turtles. We'll go to 20 degrees. Let's try that. Whoops. Start. There we are. Okay, it propagates much faster. And these are built into the simulations is the temperature dependence of those transition rate constants, the differential equations that I've been telling you about. All of those rate constants get faster at higher temperatures. So we think faster, both because we're at higher temperatures than a squid, and also because we have myelin, which makes little jumps rather than propagating from one square micron of the membrane to the next. Uh, let's see now, let's go back. Told you about voltage versus time. Uh, we'll talk about this next part next time, and uh, we will also have a quiz next time. So see you on Friday. And I, uh, yeah.